Uh, hi guys. So yeah, I'm Felix. I work for Ethereum Foundation. I'm one of the maintainers of Go Ethereum, and I'm also the maintainer of the Def P2P specifications. So in this talk, I'm just gonna you know talk about uh, things that happened around Def P2P in 2018. So yeah, I get to answer this question every year. So <laughs> what's Def P2P? Well, it's a peer-to-peer -peer networking stack. And um, it's, basically, it's a system that Ethereum nodes use to talk to each other over the network. So, and um, it has all the things that P2P networking stacks usually have. So it has a system for finding nodes on the internet. And um, it has an encrypted transfer protocol that you even heard about a bit earlier. It's not the best, but it does have one. And um, this is the protocol that uh, the nodes actually use once they are exchanging data. And um, I think the important thing to know about Diff P2P mostly is that it's an integrated uh, networking stack. So all the components work together in a predefined way. And um, this is great because it means that uh, the system has certain properties that we can rely on and it's actually much easier to evaluate the security this way. Because if, if well, if, if you know how exactly this stuff is going to be used, then it's, it's, it's easy to, 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 to reason about. So um, there are around 10 implementations of um, Def P2P right now, so you can see them listed here. Um, most of these implement, uh, like most of the Def P2P implementations are part of some kind of Ethereum blockchain client, but it's not all blockchains. So there, is, um, there are some implementations that are incomplete or they're just a library that implements a certain part of it. And um, Def P2P isn't just used for the blockchain, it's also used uh, for, uh, by other projects like the Swarm distributed file system. Uh, most of the offshoots of the uh, Swarm file system also use it. And um, even the status messenger app used it for a long time, but I'm not sure whether they're still using it or whether they've switched to something else by now. Yeah, so uh, apart from these implementations uh, that are just you know speaking the protocol, um, there are a couple of tools around. Uh, specifically, what we have is um, a couple of DHT crawlers, uh, some of them open source, some of them not. So the most famous one is ethernotes.org, which you can visit and check st stats. And um, Basically, so a DHG crawler ex explores the node discovery system to see which nodes are around, and then it lists those on the web page. And uh, then finally, for networking nerds, um, this year, Consensus has released uh, Wireshark dissectors for the protocols. And I'm actually really happy about that because it means uh, it's much easier now to debug issues with the protocol because I can just load it up in, in Wireshark and see what is the node doing. and it. Uh, labels all the packets that are being sent on the wire by name and things like that. So this is a really helpful thing. All right. Um, let's talk about the live network for a bit. So we're still alive, I guess. <laughs> um, we have around uh, 12,000 uh, Ethereum mainnet nodes, just like last year. At least that's what uh, Ethernode says. <laughs> And um, the number of DHT participants is actually quite a bit higher because um, when you look at Ethernodes, what you, what you see on the front page is Ethereum mainnet nodes, which Ethernodes has decided that you know this node is part of the mainnet, but actually in the discovery you'll find a bunch more nodes that are doing all kinds of stuff. Like there are other blockchains um, which, which have somehow imported Dev P2P. There, there's, uh, there are swarm nodes, there are all kinds of nodes listed there. So you can um, actually find a lot more nodes than just those. Um, oh, right, I forgot something. Um, yeah, actually we haven't, um, in uh, 2018, there haven't been any new attacks. So this is, well, I'm also happy about that. <laughs> so in, in general, we, we're not seeing a lot of network level attacks. So most of the attacks on Ethereum have been on the consensus uh, protocol level, uh, but on, on the network level, we haven't actually seen uh, any malicious activity as far as we know at least in 2018. So there wasn't, was not like a major uh, network disruption. But 
Um, what we did see was that there was a, a research paper was published in the beginning of the year by uh, researchers at the University of Boston, where uh, they explored the possibility of an eclipse attack on the Ethereum Discovery Network. But uh, fortunately for us, this, um, this was disclosed responsibly through the bounty program, so they um, sent the paper to us a month in advance and uh, we, we could actually read it before it was published and we could mitigate the issues. And uh, I'll talk a bit about that uh, later. So yeah, this is now uh, the section where we talk about you know, what happened in terms of development uh, in, in 2018. Uh, so the first new thing is actually kind of <laughs> kind of old. So um, all the specs were rewritten, and um, if you re read uh, the old spec, it was just one document. Uh, maybe you'll understand why. So it was uh, really hard to read. Uh, it was incomplete at times. You you couldn't really figure figure out uh, what what the semantics of the protocol were. Half of the document was stuff that never got implemented. It was just a a big bunch of, I don't know, notes, basically. So, um, yeah, I'm a bit proud to say that, you know, the specs are now much more readable and um, they're up to date. And um, yeah, just in general, I've, I've, I've split up the specs into, into, into multiple parts, so I feel like it should, it should all be um, a lot nicer now. And um, we have a test suit now. So um, this is something that I'm very excited about. Um, Frank um, has joined the Go Ethereum team very recently, and uh, he has created a peer-to-peer -peer networking test suite based on the Hive tool. So Hive is a tool that we use for testing the consensus between clients, and it's also a uh, it's also used for testing the um, RPC interface to 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 the to the clients. So now we can test the peer-to-peer -peer networking as well. And um, Geth, Parity, Aleph, and Ethereum J are hooked up to this uh, test suite, and Trinity is being added. Well, it's you know been being added <laughs> since a couple months now, so I think it's going to be done any any second. <laughs> but um, yeah, it it will eventually also be there. And uh, really, like adding a client to to Hive isn't all that hard. So it's uh, I I think this is a, a huge success. Uh, so in Geth. Uh, what, what's happened in Geth? So um, <clears throat> in the beginning of the year, we were we were really busy um, implementing the mitigation for the for the eclipse attack, and um, basically the way the attack works is that uh, a node can be surrounded on the discovery level with attacker nodes, and it won't be able to uh, find any any kind of honest node because all 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 it will know about is like. These, these, these attackers that were spawned specifically to, 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 to bring this node down. And uh, the way we approached the mitigation was to introduce uh, IP limits on the connectivity. And um, so basically you, you, can, you have to have like a, a nice looking IP address to connect, yeah, something like that. And, um, and we also um, we reworked how the discovery tables work so that uh, the table can't be overrun by attackers so easily. And then later in the year, um, we've uh, introduced support for ENR throughout the uh, Go P2P code base. Um, I'll have something about ENR later. If, if that doesn't mean anything to you, it's fine. And, um, and we've modularized the discovery code in general, so we're now ready to actually plug in different uh, pure discovery mechanisms, and um, this is massively going to help uh, with adoption of some of the new changes. But uh, most of the changes to the P2P code base haven't had any kind of immediate impact on the connectivity. So you know, as a user of Geth, you're not going to like see, I don't know, any improvements basically. <laughs> It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's basically, it's mostly been prep work. And then as um, Guillaume mentioned, uh, we've done this experiment to run, uh, to run uh, dev P2P applications on lib P2P. Um, so since he already talked about it so much, I'm just gonna skip it now. So it was, um, I think the experiment was uh, successful and we have a pretty clear roadmap now of how to integrate lib P2P into the whole dev P2P thing. Okay, so um, there are some ongoing changes to the to the to the low-level protocols. So uh, independent of any actual implementation, and um, 
Um, yeah, so what I've done uh, this year is to just, I've published three uh, EAP drafts. Um, the first one is um, EAP778, that's Ethereum node records, and this is kind of at the, at, the, at the heart of it. So Ethereum node records are a new concept. It's like a small document format about, with uh, node metadata. Um, it's a bit like business cards for, for nodes. And um, in those business cards, uh, the nodes can declare transport capabilities and application capabilities and all these kinds of things, and then they can be relayed through uh, some medium. And then uh, ne up next, we have this uh, EAP868, which is a, um, a, specific, a tiny specification that integrates uh, node records into the existing discovery protocol. So this one's really short. And uh, then finally, we have uh, something new, which is uh, the, the last item. And that one is um, a entirely new mechanism for discovering nodes based on, 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 on DNS. So um, it basically allows you to find node records behind a certain DNS name, and it's totally independent of the, of the distributed hash table. So yeah, um, ENR, so what's that about? Um, so I'll, maybe I'll, I've, it's, so when people look at the ENR specification, um, they can sometimes, well, they come back to me and they say, well, what, what, what can I use this for? I mean, this is like, you know, there, there, there are almost no details in the EAP about, you know, potential uses. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's a document format. I mean, how, how, how does that relate to, um, to, to, to the grand scheme of things? So um, the thing about ENR is that it's more like, it's like a medium for negotiating uh, all kinds of capabilities that nodes have. And um, it can be a bit hard to imagine like which capabilities are actually worth negotiating <laughs> between nodes. So I'll just have a couple examples for, 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 for you guys now. So the, one of the um, things that uh, makes me excited about ENR is that it gives us the option to switch to a, a zero round trip in, in encryption scheme. So um, if two nodes learn about each other in some discovery system, uh, what, what the discovery system can do for them is it can relay uh, key material, uh, which can be used to uh, uh, pre-compute secrets for a connection. And this is actually really nice because it means that uh, as soon as a connection between those two nodes is created, um, the, the nodes can start sending data that's relevant to the application pretty much within the first byte because, uh, because most of the secrets that are needed to, to, to encrypt their communication are already pre-computed uh, be before the connection was even created. And um, yeah, so I feel like this is, this is a pretty useful feature, but what we need for that obviously is a way to like relay this initial key material, and this is where, where, where ENR can help. Um, the second thing is, uh, well, transport options. So this is something that uh, also makes sense to, to, to negotiate upfront, because um, like Guillaume told you, uh, we have this uh, ambitious plan to uh, use some of the uh, libp 2 p uh, transport offerings in, 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 in our dev P2P stack, but in order to make this work, well, if, if you have a node that speaks libp 2 p and, have, and, and you have another that wants to talk to it, uh, that other node needs to know whether libp 2 p is supported, and this isn't really something you can just sort of try. I mean, you can poke the node and then see, well, it's not responding, but that just takes super long, and the right solution here is to just know that this node is capable of speaking libp 2 p and, um, so um, for these kinds of things, it's obviously very useful if the node can declare up front in, in, in some kind of system that it's compatible with, with, uh, with, with, with whatever transport you want to speak. And then finally, there's uh, another thing which is uh, negotiating prices. So um, what kind of prices? Well, so um, in systems like the uh, Ethereum Light Client or Swarm, you have something called an incentive system. So in an incentive system on the network level, there are clients and, and there are servers, and the clients uh, pay the servers for whatever bandwidth uh, they, 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 they're using. And um, well, that bandwidth comes at a certain price. And um, if you have an incentive system uh, set up, then there's a market for servers, obviously, because some servers are gonna have one price, and other servers are gonna offer another price, and um, as a client, you want to connect to servers that are sort of like in your price range, right? I mean, you don't have an infinite budget. You, 
you need um, you, you you need a server that that, that gives you like the most how, how do you say bang for the buck I guess <laughs> and uh, so um, to to make this work um, if you if you can already know upfront that a certain server for say Swarm can offer you data at a certain price that can influence your 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 connectivity decision as, as a client so you're obviously going to prefer the, the the servers that are you know match your your price expectations right and um, let's just go and uh, look a bit at how the DNS discovery works because this is like the the, the, the new thing so um, the DNS discovery heap is a bit different from the others because it doesn't uh, it doesn't talk about improving any existing protocol it's a totally new protocol and um, we've come up with this scheme uh, because we want a replacement for uh, bootstrap node lists. So in most uh, clients, what you'll find is there's a, there's a hard-coded list of bootstrap nodes, usually it's not that long, and these nodes are the initial entry point into the network. So when you want to talk to the Ethereum blockchain, you've got to start somewhere, so you've got to find someone who's on that blockchain, more or less. Talk to them first, and then find all the others who are also, you know, into this thing. And um, these maintaining these lists is, you know, annoying because when, when if we want to add a node to it, then we can just put in a source code. People can download some release, a new release of the client, and then they'll have it. But we'd rather, much rather, have a, a a list that's dynamic that can be updated on the fly, and the list that's like very, very long, right? So we, you know, for initial entry points, you you better give people some some options. So um, what we envision for DNS discovery is a system that can dynamically, with the help of the distributed hash table, create a massive list of nodes that have a certain uptime and that have certain capabilities, like say, let's say like a big list of, main, of, of mainnet nodes. Uh, well, then we compile them into a certain format and publish that at some uh, DNS provider. And um, well, and then clients would be able to find them there. And um, well, that's DNS discovery for you. All oh, right, and there is uh, one more feature. So the thing is, the the system also includes a certain. It's a bit like a web of trust. So one node list can actually refer to another node list using the DNS name of the list and the public key. And this means that well, certain lists can sort of authorize each other, and we can we can group them into meta lists and things like that. Um, right. So um, yeah. Uh, the EAPs, so uh, in Ethereum node records is implemented in Go, Python, and JavaScript so far. Um, the extension is implemented in Go, but isn't, um, isn't merged in the master branch. And node discovery via DNS is implemented in Go and Python, but the deployer tool that, that, that uh, moves it, to, um, moves it to, a, to a DNS provider isn't really done yet. Right, and now I have just have uh, two more minutes, I guess. More or less, it says two there, so I'm just, I, I look at this clock. <laughs> and um, so I'll just talk about a, a bit about what's next. So we have an ongoing discussion with the sharding team, uh, the, the Ethereum research team, uh, about um, how, we can, how we can join the efforts, because um, the Ethereum sharding right now, uh, the networking is based on libp2p, so I feel this is a good decision with libp2p because it gives them a lot of options to try out. But um, obviously, like I myself want to like feed my improvements that I'm working on, you know, on the, fund, the Ethereum Foundation payroll. I want to, you know, feed the, those improvements into the sharding. So um, I feel like the things that that, that we're doing here to um, to improve p 2 p these things can actually benefit uh, sharding in the long run. But um, right now, there there isn't much overlap. But like I said, we have an ongoing discussion. And then the, the biggest challenge that sharding faces is just that they need a system where um, peers can, can, can be switched really quickly and we're trying to make that work. Right, I'm, I'm gonna skip this part and I'm gonna just quickly say before I have to go that um, there's a big plan for 2019 to, to offer DevP2P as a WebAssembly module so that uh, you guys, if you ever want to use DevP2P, you don't have to use Go or like another good implementation, but probably that's gonna be Go because it's the best, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, this is a plan that we have and um, thanks.